Well, hello. Are you guys ready for me back there? Thank you. Uh, I'm here today to introduce Stephen Whistler, a local artist from Sonoma, Sonoma County or Napa Actually, County? I live in Napa. Napa County. But uh, Stephen's work is on display in the University Art Gallery. Many of you just walked over there and saw that with us. If you didn't get a chance to do that today, uh, we really encourage you to do that. It's on display until the middle of October. The Art Gallery is directly across campus out by the Duck Ponds. Uh, even if you went today, after you listened to Stephen talk about his art and his process and his purpose today, maybe you want to go take a look at it again. I was, certainly was impressed by standing under the insulation uh, of the, the bombs dropping. I thought that was a very effective presentation of art. So I'm not going to say too much more because Stephen can speak for himself and he's right here. He's going to talk with us about the tyranny of objects uh, and his recent work all of which is related to our themes in this course, which is thinking about war and peace and their issues. So please welcome Stephen. Thank you. Let's see, maybe you can clip that on here. Somewhere. Okay, and then this. All right, so you can all hear me, huh? Is that working? Good. So, what about the house lights? Do we want to dim those, or can we turn that down somehow so we can see the image? It's totally washed out. Is there? Yeah. There we go. Um, I think it's a little better. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. All right. So, well, this image that you see right now is the announcement card that I designed and photographed uh, when, when that big bomb piece called The Fat Man at 11.02 a.m. was in my studio. I couldn't stand it up. I couldn't install it the way it was in the gallery because I only have eight feet, foot high ceilings. So I tilted it up and um, photographed it kind of in the dark. So anyway, the beginning of the lecture, I'm just going to show you a few images from my childhood. Some images that, uh, this is my father, who was a Navy pilot, and um, he, uh, he went to the Naval Academy and was really into his military career, and uh, I just thought I'd show you a few images uh, to give you an idea of the kind of milieu that I grew up in and the kind of images that I saw. This was his jet taking off from the deck of the USS Midway uh, aircraft carrier. And there's the aircraft carrier, the Midway, which he was air officer on. Uh, these ships, the aircraft carriers, do indeed these days carry atomic weapons. All right, now this is a picture of my dad giving a, a, a lecture. And you, you can see the rest of the family in the background. And there I am on my mother's lap. And everybody's fallen asleep. So uh, I guess my dad wasn't always the best speaker. <laughs> Commander George Whistler, yes, that was at Miramar Naval Air Station down near San Diego. All right, so I, I, I did a lecture a, a couple of days ago, which I mostly focused on um, my in, entire uh, work from, from the 1980s to now. But I cut out a lot of that stuff for this lecture just because to kind of speed it up a little bit. Uh, I do want to show you a few early works from, this is from the 90s, uh, where I was dealing with issues of, of torture and, and interrogation. The piece on the left is, is a sculpture made out of charred wood called Interrogator. And the one on the right, which features me, it's called Star Pillory. And that was actually based on a, on a real torture device that ha had been used in, um, in the Middle Ages.
and some big drawings that were uh, sometimes done um, as preparatory drawings. Uh, these are all done in charcoal. So the sculptures themselves were made out of charred wood, so making the dra drawings out of charcoal really you know, made a lot of sense uh, to me. This is another piece called Personal Prison. It's a prison that you can roll around and take with you everywhere you go, because don't we all kind of carry our own personal prisons with us all the time? Don't worry, I'm not going to get into a self-help thing. Um, on the left is the Watchers. It's two towers together. People can get inside of them, and then they have eye holes, and they could look at each other through the eye holes. But there was something ominous about those cone shapes, you know, and they kind of hearken to those hats that the KKK wear and that kind of thing. The other piece on the right is um, a sculpture called Isolation Tower that I did uh, at a private residence in, in Germany, actually. All right, now, this is an image from my loft in New York, or three images. And the, the, the one on the right, that's my cat, Marshy. And Marshy used to jump from the sculptures onto the, onto the armoire and then get on top of the, the tall sculpture. And she, did, she actually terrorized my house sometimes and knocked over a really big piece. But there's something kind of interesting that I haven't mentioned to anybody in any of these lectures before, is that right outside that window, on the other side, was Rupert Murdoch's apartment um, that he built. Uh, he, they spent a couple of years renovating this place. And I just want to tell you a little anecdote about, about Rupert Murdoch living across the street from me. One night, it was in September, uh, about, eh, I'm thinking it was around 15 years ago. You know, the UN is meeting in New York right now and at the General Assembly. One day, I, I, I walked back to my loft and my street was blocked off and there were police all over the place. And I asked one of the policemen, what's going on? And they said, the prime minister is coming tonight to Rupert's place. Hmm, that's weird. What prime minister? She didn't say. Anyway, so we're in, the, we're in our loft and helicopters start appearing. There's four helicopters flying around, police helicopters. And then we notice marksmen on the roof with automatic weapons. And, and it, it, all of a sudden, so we're out on the fire escape watching all this stuff going on, wondering what the hell's going on next door across the street. All of a sudden, five big black Escalades pull up in formation and zoomed in and out waddled Ariel Sharon with Murdoch and, all, uh, and a bunch of the people from f the Fox News. And they had a big uh, party for Ariel Sharon that night. And the marksmen on the were on the roof, and I went up on the roof, and I started taking photographs, and I accidentally set off my flash. And all of a sudden, all the window shades went down at once, and one of the marksmen said to me, we'd appreciate it if you didn't do that. And I said back to him, trying to think of something quick, we'd appreciate it if you would uh, further world peace. And that's how that ended. But it was very strange. That, that was in Soho, in downtown Manhattan. OK, so this is my little red wagon, which uh, is also a coffin. I did a series of pieces that, um, that dealt with, well, this is like, you know, childhood and death all wrapped up into one sculpture. 
And it fits me perfectly, by the way, and I may get buried in that. I still have that. There's a small one called Traveling Companion, which is a, uh, another little, little coffin. But you know, when you travel, death always travels with you. And this is an installation of work uh, at a gallery in New York. Um, by the way, if anybody has any questions in the middle of all of this, please feel free to uh, say something. Um, I'm going to try to move through the earlier stuff a little bit more and get to the more recent work. So this is um, self-portrait in a cage. I used to wear a lot of white shirts. And this is called For the Birds. These are all uh, multicolored little birdhouse, coffin-shaped birdhouses. And this is my van, the Whistler Mobile, stuck in the snow in, on West Broadway in New York. So, you know, New York is like, it's a great place to live, but you, you, you definitely have to deal with some hardships. And also, for a long time, I was a contractor, and I built interior, I did interior renovations for clients, but I also built and designed furniture for a number of years. But you can see my, my kind of quirky uh, ideas still come through, even in the furniture. This was a setup for an ICFF booth, uh, International Contemporary Furniture Fair, which I did five different times in, in New York. Okay, now, this is back in California, and this piece called Playhouse is another kind of meditation on my childhood, where I, um, I built this house that would be such a perfect structure for kids to play in, and then set it on fire. And here it is at Chandra Cerrito Contemporary Gallery in Oakland. Um, so the interior is burnt, and it's burnt out, but it's, uh, it's still around. It's a sculpture. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't burn to the ground. So then I, I did a series of, of drawings of guard towers and, and um, observation posts and border towers and that kind of thing. And these are all charcoal and paper. Um, some of you noticed the, the pastels that I did, uh, the, of the bombs and the drones. And the, the, this was when I developed this technique. It's, um, it's kind of an odd technique that I, that I use. So I, I find the images on the internet, and then I scale it up and alter it, and uh, it, in Illustrator on my computer, and then the, um, I, I print them out, and I don't know if you guys know anything about Illustrator, but in Illustrator you can, you can tile things, so you, you can print it out on s smaller pieces of paper and then tape them together. And so what I do is I print them out on typewriter paper, tape them together, and put the charcoal or the pastel on the back side, and, and then use that to transfer. And I transfer the images onto a nicer kind of paper and pound on it and uh, kind of almost attack the paper with my hands. And then I pull it off and go back into it with, with my fingerprints. Now these have much less of the fingerprint thing in it. And I developed that more later. So um, this one is called Berlin. It comes f f actually from a uh, guard tower that was at the Berlin Wall. And this one, Grenzturm, was also uh, one of the German towers at the border between East and West Germany. Now, my wife actually is German, and she lived really close to these kind of towers, only about 12 miles away. Uh, when she was growing up. 
Um, so these are much more recent guard towers. The one on the left is a portable guard tower that uh, police departments use, and they can be folded up, and then they can be brought someplace. They put them up, and then they can watch crowds and that kind of thing from them. Uh, they also they used them at Zuccotti Park in New York, um, you know, during the, the uprisings there. And then the one on the right is actually what led me into thinking about drones, because this tower at Gaza is actually a, um, an unmanned tower. It is, uh, but it has weapons mounted on it, and it can be operated from afar, like drones. And so, you know, they have rooms filled with people looking at video screens, watching um, the, the Gaza Strip using these, these towers. And they can be activated and they can shoot to kill with those things without any humans being in, in them. Uh, this was a proposal for a project that I wanted to do that never happened with two towers, both of them with video monitors and watching each other, kind of like that earlier piece called The Watchers. And this shows some of this work in my studio, along with one of the first of the drone drawings, uh, Blue Predator, which is also in the exhibit. And a couple of these are in the exhibit as well. So, Drone War One and Drone War Two are, um, one of those is in the exhibit, and, um, or are they both? No, now I'm confused. But, um, so again, I, you know, I, I take these images from all kinds of different angles and, and, and blow them up or shrink them down and play around with the scale to give a sense of this kind of overwhelming um, force. And all of these things are, do not have humans on board. They are operated remotely. You know, when the United States uses a, a drone in Yemen to kill somebody, the operator is probably in Florida. Um, or maybe even in Arizona. And, um, and then here's a couple that are more individual. These are both in the show, too. I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of the, of the, of the menace of these things in these drawings. This is a much smaller drawing, but kind of gives you, you can, you can see the, the fingerprints are much more evident in the scale. And there's Blue Predator. So the Predator drone is one of the most used and one of the most, to my mind, fearsome of these, of these devices. So, that, you know, just to back up a little bit, I, it is visual art, and so I do have, you know, aesthetic uh, concerns that I'm dealing with in these. Um, the, the grid, which is made by the paper and kind of shows my work and my work process, but it also serves um, pictorially as um, it, to, to show the flatness of the picture plane so that there's this kind of um, give and take between the, the rendered object and the picture plane itself, which is flat. And I also see the grid as, as a kind of metaphor for a screen, like you're, like you're looking at a screen, like the drone pilots who are looking at screens that are gridded up like that. Okay, so this, oh, is there audio on? Yes. There is, okay. And to get this to start, I just click on it. Ah, there we go.
No? Uh, I think I hit the wrong thing. No? Do you want to start this? Well, I, I, I'm a Mac user, so I don't know. These things can be wonky, and you sent me the, the link as well. So. We showed you last night. These drone signs Thank you. are popping up in places around the Bay Area, like on Highway 37. The signs are fake, of course, but they certainly look real. It's a black and white reflective sign, just like the signs that, that we use on the side of the road for uh, speed limits and everything else. The CHP reminds drivers it definitely does not have drones. But the bigger mystery was who made these things? Well, we found him. He's an artist who lives in the North Bay. We just finished talking with him. Here's the artist in his own words. I went to a sign shop. I cut the aluminum myself. I figured out the font. Just like the signs that, that we use on the side of the road. A sign that really looks like something that Kyle transferred. Did it professionally. I wanted that kind of what? The first officer who saw this on Highway 37 did a double take. What the hell is going on here? The genesis of this idea was just seeing the signs that say speed enforced by aircraft. And I was thinking about the absurdity of that idea. What are they going to do? Strafe us? But there's a really serious side to this, you know? I think we all have to be aware of what's going on with the NSA and with all the snooping in the internet and the phones, and I think the drones really tie into that. Along with not having drones, we definitely do not have any drones that would fire any type of weaponry. With a Hellfire missile, yeah. Now, that was a little bit of an added touch, I have to admit that um, I, I did it for the, the graphic quality, and that's more of the joke part, but you know. But it is illegal to post any sign that resembles an official traffic sign. I don't know what the consequences will be. Uh, I just felt like it was something I needed to do. Plus, um, well, it has brought some excitement into my life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so I, I did these signs. Whoops. Okay. No, no, that's, that's the only video. Okay. So, so basically I explained my, my idea behind it, you know, seeing the signs that said speed enforced by aircraft, and I thought, yeah, something could be done with that for sure. So, so I, I made all these signs, I, I made six of them that I, that I put up on various highways. This is on Highway 37. Just, uh, you know, just past the racetrack. And, and then um, I have some other locations. Now, you know, some people thought, well, well Stephen, are, are, are you going to do this in the middle of the night and put them up? And I, no, that's not the way you do it. What you do is you act like you're doing, like you're supposed to be there. So I had my white pickup truck. I put out cones. I had a friend come with me. Um, I, you know, I, I wore the, the, the vest and the helmet. Also, it's really important to have a tape measure if you're going to try to pull off something like this because it makes you, or a clipboard, because that, that just makes you look really authentic, you know. So, um, so this was at right when I was installing them. Um, my friend Lewis, uh, he took the photos for me and helped me install them. So, uh, now, I did, I did get into a little bit of trouble. Um, a couple of weeks, well, first of all, the, the signs only stayed up for about four or five days. Uh, some of them didn't even last that long. But, um, I, so, um, the guy from CBS News found out about me because I had I kind of outed myself on the internet. You know, I posted images on Facebook, and, and then once it was on CBS News, it really went viral. It kind of, there, there were articles all over the place about this speed enforced by drones. I mean, as far away as Brazil and France and Germany. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you look up speed enforced by drones uh, on Google, I'll, I'll definitely come up. 
And so I had a visit um, a couple of weeks later from a very nice highway patrol investigator. And she came to my house and we sat and I explained things to her, explained what I had done and admitted to it. I had to write a confession and sign it. And she said, we're, we think we're going to have to prosecute you, but we're not sure. Now, for my own defense, I was tape recording our conversation and she asked me to turn it off. So I did, and she looked at me and said, we love this project. Everybody at the CHP loved this thing. <laughs> so about three months later, I got a letter from the California Highway Patrol, and in it, it said, we are holding five, because one other municipality got one of the other signs, five speed enforced by drone signs, and uh, we're holding them for safekeeping, and you can come and pick them up. So I was off the hook, which was great. No trial. Although I was sort of wa wanted to have a trial, because that would have given me even more publicity. But anyway, uh, my wife was really happy that, that nothing else happened, you know. So um, when I went to pick up the signs, that the CHP had them all, in Corte Madera at their office there. Uh, this one, that, that one right there on the right, that was on Highway 101, by the way, and uh, not far from the CHP. Um, so as I was loading them up, they, t two of the officers said, oh, could we have one? And so they wanted one for their uh, hallway of memorabilia and I, I assume it is up there in Corte Madera right now. And then uh, one of the, the first officer that the guy talked about doing the double take, he wanted one too. So I'm assuming that's at his house. Okay, so then back to my, my, my work. Um, so that was in 2013 I did that. And... Then I, I was also still working on the drawings. I, I had done a lot of the drone drawings, as you can see in this, these two images. And I built this tower, which I called Observer. Uh, and in this tower, you could walk up I inside of it. And so what happens is you become the watcher when you're in the tower. So, so the viewer becomes the 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 interrogator or something, so to speak. And you take part in the, you know, the, the watching of, of the work and other people. There it is at night, out in Fort Mason in front of Art Market. And there I am in it at, uh, at the opening at, at Chandra Cerrito Gallery. This was a piece I did at um, Paradise Ridge, which is not far from here. Uh, there's a sculpture park there. Um, and uh, I called it Guardhouse, and it was kind of a, a strange mashup of, of my tower ideas. You could actually you can get inside of it. Um, and there was a little stool in there and a desk. And but it was also a birdhouse with all these holes for, for the birds and perches for the birds. And there it is on the interior. Now, I, I, I'm not like totally obsessive about only doing weapons. I also do other things that are destructive, like hurricanes. And I did a whole series of, of drawings of hurricanes, also done you know, with the same technique with my fingerprints. And this one called Portrait from a Dream, actually, I had this really vivid dream of me as a child being led by my father through this, th through an aircraft carrier. Um, and so uh, I, 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 I just felt like, you know, I, I had to do this about that dream. So 
So this is one of the first um, of the nuclear bomb images. These get kind of blown out. You, you guys saw, you saw the real thing. It's, it's a lot better to look at the real drawings than to see the photos. Four hydrogen bombs. First lightning is the first Soviet bomb. Uh, based on Fat Man and based on the um, information that they were able to get from spying on the United States. This one is called B-1. The B-1 is in the current arsenal. It is much smaller than the Fat Man that I, that I did in, in the gallery there. It's probably, I think it's about uh, eight feet long, something like that. But it is far more powerful than, than the Fat Man would ever be. As a matter of fact, now they've gotten them to the point where they, they can like dial a megaton. They can, they can say, well, it's gonna have 15 megatons or it's going to have 30 megatons of power, um, which, you, you know, I mean, that, that, that concept is just um, kind of insane to me. All right, so this is um, an image from uh, an art fair that I, that I participated in in, uh, in L.A., uh, the startup art fair, and this is in a hotel room. Now, the hotel, I, the idea behind the startup art fair is that the artists go in and they can occupy the, the, the hotel for a week and they, you know, and show your work. And I thought, why not use the beds as part of the work? So I brought black sheets and black pillowcases brought my own pillows, so that's like the base of, of the sculpture. And I fabricated these bombs out of uh, sheet metal, and, and wood and sheet metal and aluminum, and, um, and I call it sleeping bombs. Now, even back in 2017, people weren't really talking about nuclear weapons very much. It was really only in the last, last year or so that people have been thinking about it more, what with North Korea and, and uh, the combination of North Korea and Donald Trump as President of the United States. But, um, so, you, you know, there's, there's a, a sense of humor to the work, but there's also, a, a deadly seriousness to it, you know? And then I had, I had like the family portraits all around the bed, the beds. Okay, now, I also um, have reused those same sculptures. The, the ones that were on the bed, I, I fashioned that into the, this one on the cart, and I would, um, I, I, I did several performance pieces with it, where basically I, I, I dress in my, my uniform, which is the suit, and with a white shirt, and, and walk around with my bomb as if it were, well, open carry, you know? All these people going around with weapons all the time, why not have a bomb with you instead? There I am at uh, Art Market in San Francisco. My idea was that I would walk around and just stare at people rather like I did there. And people were really put off by it at, at the Art Market. Then later, I, I decided to soften it up a little bit and ask people if they would like to pet my bomb. Uh, 
my, my pet bomb. There I am in the desert, walking the bomb out in Joshua Tree. I was invited to be in the show down there called the Joshua Treenial, and um, these all, all bunch of sculptors were, were invited, and everybody did different things, but I, I walked around with my bomb throughout the desert. Well, not throughout the desert, but at least around that area in Joshua Tree. So, I, I, I really liked the idea of bringing it to the desert because the, uh, you know, the first atomic weapons were exploded in, in New Mexico. And that's where they, they put them all together, in Alamogordo and uh, uh, what's the other name of that other town? Uh, pardon me? Los Alamos. Los Alamos, thank you. That's where they actually put them together there. There's another view of me. I'm looking for a site to bomb or something, you know? So then I repurposed it again into another piece. This was at a gallery down in San Jose called Art Arc. So um, I'm not against um, reusing my work in different ways, you know. The, the truth of the matter is these things take a long time to build, and so the idea of kind of recycling it into another work makes sense to me. This is in another show, the same guy that put together the Joshua Trenial, did um, this, it, this show in a Quonset hut. Um, and the weird thing is, is that when I was a kid, I lived in a Quonset hut on uh, Alameda Island at the Alameda Naval Base. And they had this whole, it was like a village of Quonset huts there. And they uh, were not really nice places to live, to be honest with you. But I, I had that experience of living in one of these things. Um, has, has any of you guys heard the name Quonset Hut before? It actually comes from a town in, in Massachusetts called Quonset, where they invented it. The military built them, these curved shapes like that, because um, they were really quick to put together. Um, they, they had the, the metal all bent and you just had to bolt them together on, on site. So anyway, there were a bunch of people's work in this show. But I, I particularly liked the, the combination of this flying roadway and my bomb coming down. I thought that was uh, a good combination. Um, this is a drawing that's not in the show. It's called Atlas, and it's based on the, uh, the Atlas rocket, which was one of the first ballistic missiles. It's one of the few drawings where I used the writing and the, the emblem. Otherwise, I sort of like them to be more like primary objects and not have the insignia. This one obviously as well. This is, um, this is a Titan II. It's called Titan II Launch. And Nike, the Nike missiles, uh, some of you may know about the Headlands. Uh, which is right near Sausalito in Marin. There's a national park there now, but the, uh, the Headlands was originally used as a Navy uh, or a military base where they had, um, a long time ago, they had big cannons set up there. But then during the Cold War, they built Nike bases there. And the Nike missiles were also uh, nuclear-capable missiles that were used um, for, to try to shoot down anything in incoming or to shoot at ships in the distance. 
The Headlands is a, an interesting place because there's also now a, uh, like an art colony there. Um, there's a, uh, a place, it's called the Headlands, and it's in part of an old abandoned army base. Um, this is an installation from a couple of years ago at this gallery that I show with in Oakland called Chandra Cerrito Contemporary. And on the, on the right is uh, a drawing that's in the show. All of these are in the show, actually. And, except that the thermonuclear flashcards on the left are, there are a lot more of them. There's 60 of them in the show. There are even more. Those are all done with a stencil technique that I developed. Um, just cutting out a stencil of the image and then painting it with, uh, with a, uh, India ink and a brush. So the one on the right, which I call Fautzwei in der Wuste, is a V2 rocket in, in the desert. So what the meaning of that is, is that the United States at the end of World War II, we didn't have the rockets and missiles that the Germans had developed. So um, at the end of the war, they were able to capture some of them and bring them back to the United States and they they used them in the, in, the, in the desert, shot them off, and learned how they worked and figured out. They also brought over uh, the scientists who had, had built these uh, weapons. Now, V2, or Fao Tsui, is what they were called, but the, the name of the weapon was the Vergeltungswaffen, which means reprisal weapon. And that's what they called them. Um, and they, these were the rockets that were shot at London and Birmingham and other cities in, in England. Um, they're, they're not missiles because missiles are guided and you can direct where they go. Rockets are more like you just shoot it up and hope that it lands somewhere. Um, and then in the middle is uh, four hydrogen bombs. And there's the thermonuclear flashcards again. So this was actually, this photo was taken here. And you can see every one of them is different. So one of the things I wanted to point out was the kind of absurdity of all these shapes. And, and I, I, I kind of mashed them all together as if they were the same scale, although some of these are really giant and some of them are small. So I m played with the scale, but every one of them has, um, it's either a rocket or a bomb. And so they alternate back and forth. And every one of them has a, a little title on it. And if I had the list, I could read it all to you, but then you'd really be bored. So here are um, six of them. So you can get a little bit closer view. The one in the center is actually a giant Russian rocket missile. Um, and then this one is the same as uh, the, it's called the RDS-1 or First Lightning. The one on the left, bottom left, is an, I, I know is an Iranian one. And the one on the far bottom right is a cruise missile. And it was the like the cruise missiles, the, the 59 cruise missiles that, that uh, Trump shot at the air base in Syria soon after he was in office, just to, 
for no real good reason, because the air base was back in operation within a week. So this is a portrait I did. I did a whole series of portraits that I, I'm not showing you of, of um, artists who committed suicide. But um, this one is of Robert Oppenheimer. And Oppenheimer was the leader of the group of scientists who developed atomic weapons. And um, famously, once the bomb actually worked at the Trinity site, Oppenheimer said a line that he had learned from the Bhagavad Gita, I am become death, destroyer of worlds. And he said it in Sanskrit, not in English. He was fluent in Sanskrit and in several other languages. He went to school in Germany for quite a while. Um, and uh, I mean, Robert Oppenheimer was actually a very conflicted person, conflicted about what he had done. And um, you can imagine to have that weight on you, that you're responsible for developing nuclear weapons. So this is the, the one landscape drawing in the show. I have one portrait and one landscape. Trinity, which is the site in New Mexico where the gadget was exploded. The gadget was what they called the first atomic bomb. You know, we were just discussing, a couple of us at the gallery, about how uh, the scientists weren't really sure what was going to happen when that thing was exploded, since it's the first time that, you know, uh, uh, nuclear fission actually happened on, on the Earth. They, some of the scientists, had done some calculations where they weren't sure, but perhaps the entire atmosphere would burn up and explode. That the chain reaction would continue going throughout the atmosphere. Luckily, that didn't happen, or we wouldn't be here today. Anyway, I, this image, I, I I took from two different photographs, one a contemporaneous one of the site that shows the landscape, and the other one shows the tower and the gantry that they, they brought it up in, and the, uh, the object down at the, at the base of, of the tower is, is the bomb, and they hoisted it up into the little house on top, and that's where it was exploded from. And you can go there to this day. There is a marker there on the site, and you can still find little bits of fused glass and what's called tritium, a, uh, a metal that uh, was made there. It, I don't think it's, it, it's not um, dangerous to go there, but there is a little bit more radiation there than there is in the rest of our atmospheres. Okay, so I was invited to be in, a, in an exhibit uh, in San Jose at the San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art, excuse me. The show was called Prinstallations. Prints and installations mashed together. And I hadn't made any prints for at least 35 years, maybe even longer. Certainly not any woodcuts. I'd only done a couple of woodcuts in my life before I did this. So I did a series of, of, of small woodcuts on different kinds of wood. and I wasn't really happy with the way the grain was coming out and stuff. So I, I picked some, some through, my, through my knowledge of wood from my furniture days, I also knew about, um, you know, carving wood and that kind of thing. 
Um, but uh, so I use this material. Uh, it's a plywood with um, with a veneer on it, uh, and I picked uh, white oak. It's a plain sliced white oak is what the particular kind of veneer is, and because it has this big open grain pattern, and I, I really wanted that combination of of the natural and the man-made, which shows up in all my work. You know, it's also in the fingerprints. That's the natural. Um, and then, you know, my shoes just for scale purposes. So then I went to a, um, I, I, I went through a whole other process to make, to make the large prints. I, I decided to cut them on a, a, a computerized router table rather than carve them by hand because I could have more control over it. And so I, I developed, I, I, I photographed the smaller one and, and I used that to develop a file in Illustrator that is um, what they call a vector, a vector file. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's basically it's lines. And the lines um, can be manipulated. And so, the, and the machine, the CNC router, follows the lines. So on, on the bottom there, that's the plywood panel, and then that was the first print that I pulled off of it. And to, to, to do a woodcut of that size, you've got you've to get the ink really even on there. It's this tool called a brayer, which is around, it looks kind of like a, do you know we have a lizard in the house? Yeah, I'm that up. It's a natural one. Poor guy. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> he's getting more laughs than I am. Um, so um, yeah. So anyway, the the ink has to be spread really evenly, and then it took hours of being on my hands and knees of of rubbing that out. You know, the best way to capture these things is like with a piece of cloth, you can put it on top of it. And because I've had to deal with this at my house quite a bit. <laughs> if anybody has a scarf or something. <laughs> Maybe just... How are we doing on time? We're fine. <laughs> are there more lizards in the room? Well, she seems to be. <laughs> yeah, but if he goes through that door, then where is he? Out of our hair. Sorry. You know, when, when I was a child, I, I, I lived down there in Miramar. I, sh I showed you guys that picture of my father in his dress whites giving the talk. And when, when I lived in, 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 in that part of San Diego, we lived on the same block as Jim Morrison. Um, Jim's father was also in the Navy. And um, his, his father, Admiral Morrison, died a, a, not that long ago. But I say that only because he fashioned himself the Lizard King. <laughs> I didn't know Morrison. 
I may have met him as a child, but you know, who knows? He was like six years older than me, so. <laughs> anyway, so here is that same installation that you guys saw at the gallery. Uh, I call it From a Great Height. The title refers to, actually, it comes from a Radiohead song. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Paranoid Android. It's a, it's a great song. Um, but there is a refrain in it, From a Great Height. And I, I felt that that really worked with these images. So, you know, I, I developed this, this way of, um, so that they're not framed. They're, they just have wood at the top and bottom. They're very vulnerable. They're, they're very thin paper, but luckily pretty strong paper. And um, I just, I, I, I liked that kind of irony of doing these, these bombs on Japanese paper using really a Japanese technique. The, the woodcut is an ancient Japanese technique. And I used the Japanese uh, technique of rubbing it out with what's called the baron. Uh, this is an object that you use to, to rub on top of the paper. So, um, you know, I like to have irony in the work. And there's a shot here at, uh, at the gallery at SSU. Okay, so now on to the fat man. I, uh, I just wanted to show you a couple of images of how I, how I built it. The, uh, the frame was all made out of plywood, and I used um, this half-inch Baltic birch plywood that comes in five-foot by five-foot sheets, which was perfect since the bomb was five feet in diameter. I could cut these rings out and get them all the right size. Um, I, you know, I just, I, I figured it out from a, from a very simple drawing, basically, and just kept putting it all together, keeping it geometric. And you can see on the interior, where it, the way it's all uh, bolted together to make sure that it didn't come apart when it was hanging there. And then the handprints, you know, the, it's a, that's a really significant thing to me. That the, it's not just the hand of the artist, it's like a, it's a metaphor for, for humans. And it's also, you know, the drawings, they start out on the computer, but I finish them with the most ancient digital technique available, which is your fingers digits, and so the, um, so the handprints in the, in the paper mache, or said properly, papier mache, is uh, really important to me too, because of that human touch. You know, we built these things, humans did, and we can also take them apart. All right, so now here it is arriving at the school on the back of this trailer. And it was kind of fun to, to have it on the back of the trailer, driving it from Napa to Sonoma. And I, I did get some kind of odd looks, you know. So at the end of this project, um, I have the possibility of showing that piece in San Francisco. But whether that comes through or not, I'm going to uh, put it on the back of a nicer trailer. This one was pretty funky. And one that's sized to it a little bit better. And I, I want to drive it into the city and go over the Golden Gate and, you know, document it. Uh, maybe drive it down into the financial district and just see what people's reactions are. And there it is, the fat man at 11.02 a.m. And I think, is that my last slide? Yes. So that's it.
Any answers? We got about 17 <laughs> minutes for talk. Okay. I'd love it if you would just talk about the title of the installation, the tyranny of objects, and how that relates ah. to, your, to your handprint and what you're saying there about. Right. About well, you know, uh, titles are difficult. Um, you know, I'm a visual artist, but it always, you always have to kind of explain yourself somehow. So everything always needs a title. The show needed a title. And I, I went through lots of different titles in my mind. But I, I decided the tyranny of, of objects was the, the right thing. And not the tyranny of bombs or the tyranny of weapons, but the tyranny of objects in our day-to-day -day lives, you know? Um, it, I, I mean it to be somewhat poetic and a little bit open-ended. As a matter of fact, I mean all the work to be kind of um, open to discussion, a, a little bit ambivalent in that I'm just showing you these objects without any kind of commentary, unless you hear me talking about it, of course. But just seeing them, you know, I'm actually interested in your reaction to the work because some people think, oh, I mean, this guy is like extolling the virtues of bombs and he loves these things. Or is it the opposite? Am I trying to make a critique of them? Um, and I'd be interested in your feedback on that um, if anybody has any thoughts. Sure. I'm curious why you choose to do illustrations all in one color. Ah, well, I, I don't want the, uh, it's kind of, that, it, it, it's a very good question. Um, I, I, I don't see myself as a colorist, per se, but I, I do love working with color. And, um, you know, I, 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 I like working in the, in the monochrome, monochromatic. Um, so then the color, in a sense, becomes much more um, okay, so for the drones, you'll notice in, if I back up a little bit, you'll notice in, in the guard towers that I did, those were all just black and white in charcoal. And I decided that the drones, I did a few of them in charcoal, but they just weren't working. And as soon as I started adding color, getting the blue into it, you know, the blue, the sky, the, the, that r relates well to the drones, I think. Um, but then with the, with the bombs and the rockets, the bombs I did in red, red is of course, you know, fire, blood. Um, it, it relates to lots of different, uh, more violent kinds of things, potentially. And um, yeah, so, and then I decided to do the rockets in yellow, and I, I really like the way that works in the exhibition with red, yellow, and blue, black, white, and gray. Um, yeah, I don't know. I hope that answers your question. Any others? Yeah? Yeah. You chose colors for their sim like symbolistic values. Yes. And you found that using just that color and different values of that color mm -hmm. helped you promote that symbolism more? I think so, yeah, yeah. Also, you know, to, to tell the truth, um, as, as um, when I was a kid, I had some trouble with colors. And I would pick the wrong crayon colors because it turns out that I'm actually slightly colorblind. I'm a regressive trichromide, it's called. And um, so I have a little trouble with like browns and khaki, green, and those kind of things. I can't tell the difference. But red, yellow, and blue I can see really well. <laughs> so, 
So that's why I like to work with the primary colors. An another reason why, yeah. Yes? Right. Um, my experience was that the way you displayed it, it was almost objective, which allowed us to kind of, from our own opinions, decide whether it was pro or not. It's right. Itself, it just kind of is. And yeah. People kind of, based, based on their opinions, already decide what it means. At least that was my experience. Yeah. Well, that's what I. That's what I intend. It's just to to leave it open like that for the viewer to decide. You know, if I, I, it, it ran through my mind that, well, if you, you could do um, mushroom clouds and, uh, and destroyed cities and all of that, but I was more interested in the potential that these objects have within them and to somehow show that potential and not deal with, you know, burnt babies on the ground or something like that. Uh, as part of the imagery. Um, yeah, so thank you. I appreciate that. Any, any, any answers? Anybody have any answers? <laughs> yes? I don't have an answer. I have a question for you. Okay. Oh, well, that's interesting. You know, my, my father, who uh, died about six years ago now, um, actually, I, I, I think I told this to you, but I didn't tell you guys, that after my dad died, I, I, um, I did a little research on him and, online. And I was surprised to find images of him when he was working in Vietnam. And there was um, a photographer who had taken uh, several photographs of him and, and a bu bunch of other people involved in the war effort. And there was a caption on one of his images. And what my dad was doing was he was working for naval intelligence and he was choosing sites in North Vietnam to be bombed by the United States Navy. So that really set me off. I had already been doing the work about the drones um, before, he, before he died, but that revelation of that he picked these bombing sites really kind of sent me for a loop, you know? I, it was something he never talked about, and um, I was... Uh, so in, in a weird way, I see... I see these, me working on these drawings and these objects as almost a way of, um, I don't know if you know this word, expiating my, my, his sins, in a sense. Um, and there I am, you know, like when I'm working on the drawings, I'm, I'm covered in, in this red stuff and I'm working like crazy, like almost like a, a, like a medicine man or a shaman or something. And I see it almost as a way of, of de dealing with the psychological stuff about my father and what he did and in, in, in my work. You know, sometimes art is not explainable. You can't explain everything. And, and I, I think in, even in some of the best art, it, it's, it's, it's a feeling. It's... it's uh, it's also, it's about the, the physicality of the object. And, you know, when you walk underneath this thing and you feel that, that, that sense of the weight, and that's really important, too, to the, to the art experience, to me. Uh, I didn't answer your question, though, did I? Actually, now, other, I, uh, other members of my family... Um, uh, all, all the people in the military are gone, basically. <laughs> so they don't really know this work. Uh, you have yeah? Yeah, I, just, I wanted to give you an answer instead of a question. Oh, excellent. Um, <laughs> so when I was looking at all of the images of the drones that you made, yeah. um, it reminded me of this uh, Russian animation that I saw. Uh, it 
starts out with like drones flying over city and they drop their payloads and as the animation progresses you start to realize that this is like decades after humans have been totally wiped out by ah, the drones, right and they were just continuing to do what they were programmed to do so right like everyone was already skeletons and they just kept dropping bombs on the cities that had been destroyed for yeah decades so it's like total mechanized warfare exactly. so for yeah me, Right. Warfare kind of um, I, I was really struck by some of the um, art, you know, about my, my drone sign project. Uh, it got picked up by different media, and it was on um, InfoWars, on the InfoWars website. They, they saw it as an anti government kind of thing on my part. And then more liberal organizations, like I, I actually uh, gave a talk to uh, Code Pink in, in Washington, and they're really anti-drone, anti-nuclear protesters, you know? And they had a totally other take on it. So that was, it's really interesting to me how once you make something, you put it out in the world, you can't really control what the meaning is. People are going to bring their own meaning to it, you know? But that whole concept of, and it's coming, uh, autonomous um, drones that can make their own decisions about targets and all that kind of thing, they, they, they've got AI to the point where that's almost happening. And honestly, we really have to do something about stopping that and stopping this rush towards mechanized warfare. Now, I'm gonna give you guys a little, just a little pitch, because you know, my work is mostly, it's about power, and the use of power, and the misuse of power, but you guys have some power too. And you know what? You can vote. Please, make sure you're registered to vote, and vote in November, so that we could maybe get a government that would like to control these things rather than just let them run rampant. Okay? So please use your power.